Well, first of all, I'd like to say what an honor it is to be here in Hong Kong and get the opportunity to do a, a presentation for TEDx. This is fantastic. Thank you, Zhang, for helping me to get here. Um, I'm here to tell you a story about how four kids changed their lives and how they also changed my lives. And these kids are from the mean streets of Phoenix with so many things against them. The high school that uh, I work at is a typical inner city high school. So whatever you think of as an inner city high school and the typical problems they have, we have those. But there's a few other things that make it unique. Number one is that in our particular area, the population of the school is 98% Hispanic. And of that population, it could be anywhere to 50 to 60% of them are undocumented. So they're in the country uh, without the, the proper uh, permission. Uh, their parents came and they wanted to make a better life for themselves, so that's why they're here. Um, the other thing that's very interesting is most of those parents of the kids didn't get a high school education or go on to college for that matter. And so the parents aren't able to help their students with their education as well. Uh, the picture you see shows a warning about you know, some kind of crime that's possibly going on at the school. That's not something that we experience every day, but it does happen from time to time. When I first started working at Carl Hayden High School, I was frustrated because I wasn't able to get the students to get excited about math and science and technology. And for me, I thought that was kind of strange because I thought science and technology was very exciting and fun. And I wasn't reaching the kids the way that the curriculum was set up in this, the classroom. And so I thought, look, this, this isn't working. I, I need to show the kids how fun and exciting it can be. So what I decided to do was, hey, let's do a club after school. We'll call it the Science and Technology Club. And basically, you know, show the kids how fun science and technology can be. Then maybe they can see the relevance of how these things can be practical and pragmatic and exciting and, and challenging and rewarding. And then, you know, pay attention in their classes and understand why they need to go to the physics class or the calculus class to be able to do these things even better. So we started this club, and it started working fantastic. It was amazing how the kids were really getting interested. And one of the groups that we joined at first was the US First Robotics Club. And FIRST is an acronym. It stands for, for Inspiration and Recognition of Science and Technology. And it was created by inventor Dean Kamen and Professor Woody Flowers at MIT because they saw what was happening in the United States, that more kids were not getting interested in science and technology, but they were interested in the pulp culture, pop culture, excuse me and uh, the sports uh, uh, and entertainment business. So going into engineering or any of the STEM fields, the science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, was just not something that was on their radar. But once we started the robotics program, it was fantastic. The problem with FIRST was it would only occur during a certain part of the year. And we liked it so much that we wanted to be able to do more things with it. But you know, it only ran for like January to about May. So we found this other competition to compete in, and it was called the MATE National Underwater Robotics Challenge. And uh, we decided, hey, you know, this is a, a great experiment. Uh, let's go ahead and, and put a team together. So we found a couple students from the robotics team and a couple that were in my, one of my marine science classes. And so we had these four kids. The idea was, and we learned this from being in robotics for a while, is that we learn the most when we fail. And so it became kind of a mantra for us that, hey, you know, anytime we, we do something right the first time, we didn't really learn anything. So it's, it's kind of cool that, you know, we make mistakes, trial and error, you know, actually test ideas out to see if they work, and when they don't, try to evaluate what is it that, that caused it not to work, and then let's try to fix that. So we use that scientific method approach in trying to build an underwater robot, because none of us had built an underwater robot before. And this competition, that's what the whole point was. You had to build a robot that you can operate underwater. So you had to be able to see remotely underwater and operate it from a distance through a, a wire, a tether. And so that's, that's what the kids did. And uh, it was, uh, we had two categories that we had to you know, decide which to enter. There was a high school category and there was a university category. And so we thought, well, if our goal is to learn the most, we probably want to fail the greatest. So the way to do that is to compete against the universities, because for sure, they're going to kill us. And what we would do is then take notes on what did they do better than us, how did they achieve the things that they did, and then come back the following year with all this information. 
Okay? The other side of that was it kind of took the pressure off of the team. There was no expectation to win. The whole idea was to go there just to compete. Because it's hard to learn when you don't have any skin in the game. But when you're there and you're going to try to do the best you can, you'll pay attention to things. If we entered in the high school category and we lost, you know, that's, they're basically equals and we would feel like, you know, we probably should have done better. But we had every excuse in the world not to have done well if we lose to a university team. So that was our, that was our approach to that. So we go to the competition, and there's three components to the competition. There's an underwater mission portion where the robot has to perform, and then there's an oral presentation, and then there's a technical report. Well, the technical report we turned in you know, earlier, and you know, there's not much we can do about that. That had to be done ahead of time so the judges can use that for reference for the oral presentation. So we get to the competition, and the underwater portion was the first part. And we watch team after team go in. You'd see a robot go underneath and a bunch of bubbles come up. And you know that's not good when you're in an underwater competition. <laughs> and the other thing is we'd see robots go in and kids scratching their head and the robot just sits there. Nothing's happening. But eventually we started seeing some robots that were performing. And by the time the underwater portion was done, MIT finished in first place. So that was to be expected. I mean, they're MIT, right? And then Cape Fear Community College, which had a degree in underwater robotics technology, they finished second. And lo and behold, out of nowhere, we ended up, Carl Hayden High School ended up number three. And I'm like, wow, that's fantastic. I would have been happy to go home at that time, you know, being totally satisfied. We, we went there to deliberately lose, and we ended up in third place. So it was fantastic. But we still had other parts of the competition. There was the oral presentation that still had to be made. And keep in mind that for these students, they were going to be doing the presentation in their second language. It was not their first language. So there were not a lot of high expectations. So one of the things we wanted to do was to lower the stress level of the students. So instead of sending them in, you know, this is 2004. So remember, when you go someplace back then, if you took PowerPoint with you on your thumb drive, I don't even know if they had a thumb drive back then, I have to think. But you took something somewhere, it didn't necessarily work, or it might take 20 minutes to get your compatibility issues worked out. And we didn't want the kids to worry about that. So we went low tech. We took a three ring binder and we made it so we can stand up on a table. On the front side would be the graphs or the charts or whatever diagram we wanted the judges to see. And on the back side, there'd be three or four bullet points so the students wouldn't forget what to say. So we watched team after team go in there and they'd spend 45 minutes, an hour, and they'd come out and they'd took in their, you know, their big screens, their laptops, their, their uh, scaled model of their robots and charts and graphs and everything. And we sent our kids in with one three ring binder. <laughs> so they go in, they come out in 20 minutes. And the other teacher and I were looking at each other and we said, gee, God, they must have really screwed up. How'd they get out in 20 minutes? Or what did they do? So we asked the kids, well, how did it go? And they said, well, it was fantastic. There wasn't a question we couldn't answer. They were really impressed with us. It was great. I said, but, you know, you guys came out in 20 minutes. What did you, did, what did you guys say? And Lorenzo, the joker, kind of pointed to Christian and said, well, he said something kind of smart alecky. And he pointed to Christian, who was a smart aleck. And I said, well, what did you say? He says, well, they asked us why we didn't have PowerPoint. And I told them that PowerPoint was for people who didn't have anything to say. And, and so I'm thinking, okay, that's probably why they threw you out. You know you can't talk like that to the judges. And then Oscar, the team leader, he said, oh, you know, and they were really impressed that we knew the metric system. I said, well, why was that? And he said, well, they, like, they, they asked us why we were so comfortable with the metric system. And I said, well, that's because we all lived in Mexico and we used the metric system in Mexico. <laughs> So I, I said, well, that probably wasn't the smartest thing to say either, but, you know. But they were convinced that they did fantastic, and the other teacher and I were convinced that they did terribly. <laughs> so we go to the awards part of the competition. Uh, the, actually, the awards ceremony, I'm sorry. And uh, the first award they give out is the judges' award. And right away we think, wow, this is the, the pity prize. They didn't want to let send the poor Mexican kids home with no prize against the, you know, the college kids who just obliterated them. So that's what we thought it was. Turns out, we found out years later, that it was for an, uh, a creative uh, solution to a problem. 
I have to go back a day before the competition. We had a practice time. And we took the robot and put it in the water. And we were having difficulties. And the robot was leaking. And so we had to pull it out. And we noticed that you know, there's a, a, a leak. And even though the leak wasn't being a, you know, a major problem, it was going to be a major problem if we're in the water for 30 minutes. So later on that evening, when we're driving around looking for a place to eat, conversations started you know, around maybe using a diaper somehow to absorb all the water. <laughs> then it moved to using maxi pads. And then it ended up with tampons. And you know, being four boys and two male teachers, there was not a lot of experience with tampons. But one of the boys had sisters, and he said, well, you know, they do come small, and we're like, OK, you know. <laughs> then the point became who was going to go buy the tampons. And <laughs> they all pointed to me, and I said, well, I, you know, I, I have a teaching career. I can't be known as the tampon teacher <laughs> the rest of my life. So I, I can't do it. So we went through everyone's you know, social status, and we ended up with Lorenzo figuring that, if anything, it might actually improve his social status <laughs> if he was the one to get the tampons. So, of course, when you're not the one getting the tampons, you, know, you, you have all the advice. So we told him how to go get them. We said, look, you got to go in and right away say, you know, hi, my name is Lorenzo, and uh, we're here with this robotics team, and we got a leak, and we we're wondering if you could help us pick a tampon, because I have no idea which one to pick. So that's exactly what he did. And he comes running out of the store with a box of tampons. And we were cheering like he had scored a goal in a football game or something. <laughs> So we go back to the hotel room, and you know, being the scientists that we are, we have, how much does a tampon hold? You know, so we had these little Dixie cups, and we put about three or four ounces of water in there and put it in, and to our surprise, poof, you know, right away, it absorbed all the water. So we know now, after 10 years, that the special award was for that. <laughs> then there was an award for design elegance. And we thought, okay, our robot was pretty ugly, but it did have a few innovative features you know, that made it different and probably gave us an advantage. So that's, we can, I can understand that. Then they gave us an award for the best technical paper. And I thought, okay, they must have added up the spreadsheet wrong. That's not possible. You know? So anyway, they, they uh, start announcing the overall winners. And they announced third place as Cape Fear Community College. And we thought, okay, that's, that's, that's understandable. We can see how that would you know, work out. Then they announced second place is MIT. And I'm thinking, wow, OK, who's first place? Uh, whoever was behind us was too far behind. They can't get first. It could be us. And then I had a sickening thing, uh, feeling going on in my mind. Because I remember at the beginning of the school year when we put the team together, you know, we had this list because it was really cool to see UC Davis, uh, you know, MIT, Carl Hayden High School. And so I thought it was really cool to put that on the wall. And Lorenzo walks up and points to MIT and says, what's MIT? <laughs> and, and I said, well, that's the Massachusetts Institute of Technology. And he said, well, you know, what, what are they known for? I said, well, they're one of the best schools in the country, maybe in the world, in, in technology. And he, he says, well, if we beat MIT, would you take us to Hooters? <laughs> and, so as I thought, as a teacher, I thought that's probably the safest bet on the planet. <laughs> so I went ahead and, and, and took that, that, that bet. I agreed. And so now I, I reached across the table and I said, if what I think is about to happen, under no circumstances do I want you to run around and start yelling hooters. <laughs> and, and he said, you know, uh, you promised. And I said, oh, I'm not saying I'm not taking you. Just don't say it now. It's not professional. <laughs> So of course they announce it, and everything went went nuts. And uh, you would think that you know when we get back from the competition that we would be in the news, and there would be all kinds of media coverage and whatever. Nothing. <laughs> Zero. It wasn't until eight months later that we got a phone call from Wired magazine. And uh, it was an author by the, uh, a writer by the name of Joshua Davis who said, you know, is it true that you guys beat MIT in an underwater robotics competition? Because, I mean, that's too hard to believe. And I said, well, you can call MIT and ask them how it felt. <laughs> so he did. And he called back about 10 minutes later and said, don't talk to anybody. I, I, this is going to be a great story. I can't believe anyone hasn't done it. And I said, well, that's not a problem. Nobody's talking to us about it. So <laughs> the story's yours. 
So needless to say, in 2005, the article came out and, uh, you know, we basically uh, have 10 years of robotic success after that. Um, and it wasn't just a one-time thing. We went back several times to the competition and ended up finishing third the second year and second the third year, beating MIT all three years. But what's more amazing is that the 10 years since, you know, it wasn't just that group of kids or just that competition. Many different robot platforms, robotics platforms, and many different competitions, we've consistently been one of the top teams in the country. And, and that's a huge testament to the kids and their um, uh, desire to want to be the best. But the main thing is, and this is what I think we got expressed to all the kids, and it's very important to get this into them because this is really true. I believe it for myself or anybody that wants to do anything that you are the only one that controls whether or not you're going to do something or whether or not you're going to be successful. That's it. You can't let society determine that for you or any kind of demographic issues. You're the one that ultimately decides if that's going to happen or not. So you're in control of that. So just really briefly, because my time has already run out, uh, there is a documentary called Underwater Dreams. I highly encourage you to see that. There is the Hollywood movie called Spare Parts, and there's a book also called Spare Parts. And Leaving you with just a couple thoughts. Number one, talent can come from some of the most unlikely places that you could ever imagine, so never count that out. Number two, you want to make sure that you embrace the diversity of your population because you don't know where that next idea is going to come from. And I don't mean just ethnic diversity. I'm talking about age diversity, gender diversity, every kind of diversity you can imagine. There's been a dozen times that the diversity on our team has saved us because they came up with somewhere in our diversity, the idea came that Maybe the rest of the team wouldn't have been able to figure out. So it's been, it's been phenomenal to use that as a tool to build our team. The other thing is meaningful relationship with youngsters, with teenage kids. And I don't mean the Facebook relationships. I'm talking about relationships with people in industry, relationships to older people that they would never get a chance to talk to. So those are the kind of relationships I'm talking to. And the last thing I, I want to leave you with, and I mean this because it's kind of something that's become our, you know, our mantra today, and that is, if life doesn't give you a dream, build one. Thank you very much. It was a pleasure being here.